Hi, so in part C we're going to be talking about how neutral nucleophiles can also add to pi bond electrophiles. Notice that so far we've talked about really strong nucleophiles. We've briefly mentioned lithium aluminum hydride, dealt with the mechanism of sodium borohydride, Grignard reagents, cyanide, and organolithium species. Keeping in mind that lithium aluminum hydride and this other species, which is known as a phosphorane, will be dealt with in more detail in second year. What we're going to look at now is how these neutral nucleophiles can also react with pi bond electrophiles. The most important thing to consider when we're talking about neutral nucleophiles is that neutral nucleophiles and neutral electrophiles are often just not reactive enough to produce any new product. Otherwise said, if those two species collide, they collide without enough energy to surpass the activation barrier necessary to give a new product. So one of the things that we have to do is increase the energy of one of those two species. One of the things we can do is to deprotonate a nucleophile or make it charged. That raises its energy in a way that allows it to react with a neutral electrophile. The other thing we're, we can do, and that's what, what we're going to do here, is to protonate the electrophile. So by protonating the carbonyl, in this case we're going to, these cases we're going to be using aldehydes, or ketone in this case. By protonating that, we end up with an intermediate, known as an exonium. Because it has a positive charge, it's going to be higher in energy, or less stable than the starting material. Because it's higher in energy, it's going to react more easily with any other nucleophile. So now when we put in other nucleophiles, the nucleophile will react exactly the same way as before, exactly the same mechanism as before, to give the same types of products as we've seen before. Very typical strong acids that we use include toluene sulfonic acid, also called, called tosic acid, abbreviated TSOH, Sulfuric acid can also be used. Notice that toluene sulfonic acid is just a variation of sulfuric acid and is quite organic soluble. So one example here would be in the formation of a hemiacetal. A hemiacetal is a group that has an oxygen bound to a carbon, there's a central carbon, and an OH. So that's the functional group known as a hemiacetal. A full acetal very similar, also a central carbon, O to some R group, some alkyl group, and another O R group. A hemiacetal has only one O R group bond, the other bond is to an OH. So in terms of the mechanism of this reaction, we start out as indicated in the general mechanism, or otherwise said, we start out by protonating the carbonyl group the more basic of the two oxygens. And so now we have the activated electrophile. Notice that in this particular case, we have a lone pair of electrons on this oxygen that's held on the same molecule as the activated electrophile. What we're going to have here is our first example of an intramolecular reaction. Intramolecular refers to something that happens within the same molecule rather than between two molecules. So the first acid base step I would call an intermolecular reaction because it's a reaction between two different molecules. This step now is an intramolecular reaction. And intramolecular reactions are very fast, especially for the formation of smaller numbered rings. I'm going to number the atoms in this case so we can more easily see what ring size we're going to form. So notice that we start with the nucleophilic atom, number one, and we're going to bond number one to number six. So we're going to form a six membered ring. Now that I've drawn the ring, what I can do is add on the other groups that are still there. So for example, 
the oxygen still has a lone pair that didn't react and a hydrogen, so I can draw those in. Nothing else to draw on carbons 2, 3, 4, 5, although there are two hydrogens on each one. Carbon 6 has a bond to a methyl group, and it also has a bond to an OH, which is now neutral. The reaction is not quite done because there is a positive charge on that top oxygen. So to finish up, we're going to use what I'm going to represent as A minus. It's going to be the conjugate base of this acid. So if we had used HCl, for example, it would have been chloride as the conjugate base. And that conjugate base is going to deprotonate the oxygen, remove the proton from the oxygen to give us the neutral hemiacetal final product. So the key concept that we've just seen here, an intramolecular reaction happens between the electrons and atoms in the same molecule. Intermolecular reactions occur between electrons and atoms in different molecules. Intramolecular reactions are fast. They're faster than intermolecular reactions, particularly when we're forming three to seven membered rings. I encourage you to draw the mechanism for this particular reaction. We're going to come back to it in class, but it's very similar to what we just saw. Next thing we're going to look at is what's known as the principle of microscopic reversibility. What that principle tells us is that the reactions that are in equilibrium follow the same mechanism in both directions. So for example, let's look at the mechanism of this forward direction. We have a carbonyl that reacts with HCl. And here's the activated electrophile. We also, of course, form chloride as the conjugate base of HCl. The next thing that can happen is the addition of water as the weak nucleophile to the base of the carbonyl. Because that product is not neutral yet, in the last step of the reaction, we'll deprotonate the oxygen to return these electrons to the oxygen and neutralize it. The base that we can use to remove that proton is the chloride. And notice that we've regenerated HCl or hydrochloric acid, so it, it is acting as a catalyst for this reaction. Now say we wanted to do this reaction in reverse. I'm going to use blue arrows for the reverse reaction. In reverse, we would start with a hydroxyl, we would protonate it, and that gives us these intermediates here at the top right. The next step, we're going backwards, so we need to generate the carbonyl lone pair on the carbonyl comes down. Notice that they had gone up to get us there. Lone pair comes down and water instead of coming in goes out. That regenerates this protonated ketone. The chloride is still there and we've also generated the water. In the very last step of the reaction the chloride would deprotonate the ketone to give us the starting material again. Same mechanism, the forward and the reverse reaction. That's the principle of microscopic reversibility. The other key principle to look at is this idea that a lone pair in an oxygen can come down and push out a stable molecule known as a leaving group. Just to redraw that down below, a leaving group is any stable molecule, and a good leaving group is also a weak base. So a tetrahedral intermediate like this can collapse and push out a leaving group.
That's the idea that we're going to use over here in the formation of an imine. An imine is just like a carbonyl group, except that instead of a C double bond O, we have a C double bond N. So in the first step of the reaction, we activate the electrophile through an acid base step. Now that we have an activated electrophile, the nucleophile can come in. The base of the carbonyl and the oxygen get some electrons. Notice that we are following exactly the same mechanism as we did in this last reaction, except with nitrogen as the nucleophile now instead of oxygen. And that's the case for any of these reactions. We can use many different types of nucleophiles. Now we need to deprotonate this intermediate in order to neutralize it, and we can use the acetate, OAC minus. That's the conjugate base that was generated in this first step. The acetyl group, C double bond OCH3, is abbreviated AC. Notice that we still don't quite have the imine. We're trying to make a nitrogen-carbon double bond. So at some point, we're going to need a lone pair on that nitrogen to come down and make a double bond here. But to do so, because carbon can only have four bonds, we need to get rid of one of these bonds. So we need to generate a leaving group. In order to generate that leaving group, what we're going to do is protonate this oxygen. protonating that oxygen, we make water, which is a great leaving group. It is a very weak base. We know it's very stable because it exists all around us. So now, lone pair on the nitrogen can come down and push out that leaving group, just like the lone pair on the oxygen came down over here to push out a leaving group. And notice that we're almost at an imine. The last thing that we need to do is deprotonate the nitrogen to give us the neutral final product. So that imine can be deprotonated by, again by acetate. And that gives the nitrogen back its electrons. So there we've generated that neutral imine product. Now what we'll see is that imines react very similarly to carbonyl groups. So they can be reduced, just like carbonyls, ketones, and aldehydes can be reduced. However, imines are slightly less reactive as electrophiles. They're not quite as delta minus as they would be if there were more, the more electronegative oxygen here. So because of that, we again, if we just mix these two things together, they wouldn't react. Sodium cyanoborohydride would not directly react with the imine. What we need to do first is add an acid, like acetic acid. We protonate the electrophile first. And now we've created an activated electrophile. Once that has happened, 
this nucleophile will react. So notice that the cyanide is unreactive. It's the hydride species that is reactive. And that leads us to an amine final product, carbon to nitrogen bond. So we've just seen that we can make imines from ketones or aldehydes. We've just seen that imines can be reduced with sodium cyanoborohydride to give an amine. So in summary for part C, Weaker nucleophiles will react with activated electrophiles. We saw that intramolecular reactions are faster than intermolecular reactions for the formation of three to seven member grains. And we saw the principle of microscopic reversibility, that reactions in equilibrium take place by the same mechanism in the forward and reverse directions.